Support for Philly Centric comes from Squarespace. Squarespace for credit card processing on phone and mobile devices. Visit www.squarespace.com slash phillycentric for a special code providing special offers. This is Billy Centric. One story told a week at a time. Philadelphia Execution. A true story of murder and American justice. By Dave Evans. Episode 4, The Key Witness. When we went into the jury room to deliberate, most of us let out a collective sigh of relief. We could finally talk about the explosive events that had been occurring in front of us. The trial was the white elephant in the living room that we could not talk about for the past four days. No one wanted to discuss trial specifics in these first few initial moments. Generalized comments like, that was faster than I expected, and now I've seen everything, were just spoken out, usually to no one specific person. When we sat down for deliberations around a long wooden conference table, the first order of business was to select a jury foreman. Dick initially offered to do it, saying something like, I'll volunteer if no one else wishes to. Then I chided in. I said, I think I can do a good job for us as a foreman, but I also think there are others here who could do just as well of a job. If selected, I'll consider myself a juror first and a foreman second. I consider it a role, not a position of authority. If the group is not pleased with my performance, I would have no problem in giving up the position. I also don't mind deferring to most anyone else. Dick then said, fine, I nominate Dave, and the rest of the group agreed and forward we proceeded. I said, initially I see myself as trying to gain a consensus on some type of loose structure to our deliberations. I'd also like to go over some ground rules as far as the dynamics of working in a group. After that, I see myself as juror number three and as a foreman only when we need materials when we need to get deliberations back on track. The group was in agreement. I continued by saying, First, I think we should all have a chance just to vent and let out some of the steam regarding what we've witnessed over the past few days. Nothing very specific or detailed, but just a high-level summary of your feelings about the experience and maybe the single most compelling item that struck you thus far. Maybe five minutes for each person. I think it's important that we all have a chance to express our repressed feelings and that we all have to offer some input, especially initially. I want to avoid juror members just deferring to the group's will or engaging in groupthink, as we call it in the business world. Groupthink is where an individual accepts the group consensus just because it is what the group agreed to. After that exercise, I wanted to go over some ground rules of positive behavioral conduct in a group work environment. I have trouble remembering a lot of what was said on this initial five-minute roundtable. I remember suggesting that we start the discussion with Frank, who sat immediately to my left. Larry suggested, why don't we proceed by juror number? I thought that was a good idea, as did everyone else. If we had proceeded in the way that I initially had suggested, then I would have been the last to make my initial comments. B 
Being the foreman and being the last one to make comments might have me perceived as having the last word, and I think it was good that we proceeded by juror number to avoid that perception. The general tone was that the evidence strongly indicated that the defendant was guilty. I recollect some of the latter jurors saying that their sentiments had already been expressed. Jen and Jim also mentioned taking notice of the audience that had viewed parts of the trial. They talked about who they assumed the respective families of the victim and the defendant were. Those who were in support of the defendant sat in pews behind the defense table, and those who supported the victim and or the commonwealth sat in pews behind the prosecutor's table. On a couple of days, it was obvious some law students sat in attendance. There would be six or seven young, white, student-looking types sitting in the first few pews behind the prosecutor. The male students wore ties, and the women were dressed in business attire. They wouldn't stay for the whole day, just specific segments. I think Jen and Jim made mention of this only to give an environmental, contextual aspect to the experience we just had. Jen also mentioned that she took specific note of the alleged phone call the defendant made in an attempt to intimidate the witness. She said, that wouldn't be consistent with the behavior of a falsely accused innocent defendant. I was juror number three, and I said, I thought both attorneys did a good job. I thought the judge did a good job also, although it seemed at times he let the lawyers run his courtroom. It's an emotionally charged case, and I think the prosecution's third witness, Linda Manley, was the most compelling. All jurors were respectful of the initial time limit, with the exception of Tim. He went on for almost 15 minutes, talking about specific testimony. He would say things like, I didn't believe for a minute that he wasn't at the crime scene, and other charged statements of similar nature regarding the feelings about specific testimony. I had to chime in and cut him off and to summarize his points. I said, at this initial stage, this is just a 10,000 foot view of the trial. We'll drop down to 5,000 feet and eventually ground level fairly soon, I believe. Tim wasn't being intentionally rude. He was just being emotional and passionate about what he had to say. Dick followed Tim and was the last person to contribute. He also went on for longer than I would have liked, talking about how he thought the defense's case was weak. But I think in some ways he was trying to marginalize the effect Tim's ranting may have had on the group. He tried to lay out a reasoned, independent, balanced sentiment, but his conclusions were that the defendant was clearly implicated. After everyone had their chance to speak, I then went over some basic ground rules. I wanted everyone to keep in mind to be courteous to one another. We had a good group of people, and I didn't think that would become a major issue. I also wanted everyone to respect differences of opinion. I said, people shouldn't be pressured to conform Rather, they should express their viewpoints and be prepared to defend them against counterarguments. I also wanted to drive us toward reaching a verdict, but a hung jury was also an acceptable outcome. I added, I don't want this to turn into a social engagement. We have a job to do. I also wanted active involvement from all members. As a group working toward a common goal, I mentioned that we should make every effort to avoid side conversations or multiple conversations happening at the same time. I mentioned, when multiple conversations happen simultaneously, group members may miss valuable comments. I stressed at this point in time, and a few times later in our deliberations, that this was an extremely emotionally charged case, and we have to make every attempt not to let emotions cloud our thinking, deliberating, and decision making. I said, we're human beings and emotions are inherent to our existence. That said, we must make every effort to curb them and make sound rational decisions based on logic, not emotion. I know everyone heard those words because I stressed them on several occasions. Still, emotionally charged inflammatory language quickly made its way into our deliberations. This was especially the case with Tim. My next suggestion was to go around the room once again this time allowing for a detailed summary of the trial by each juror. After that was complete, we could decide if we wanted to take an initial anonymous vote, just to see where we stood initially as a jury. Then we could go over each witness one by one as a group. Larry then came forward saying, Dave, 
why don't we go right into the witnesses as a group first thing everyone was in agreement with that suggestion and I didn't object to it either Carl then made the comment why don't we vote now this was just the type of thing I wanted to avoid a vote before any serious deliberations took place I thought that this might be the worst possible time to take an initial vote the emotional residue from the trial was highest at this point individual bias would likely be significant we hadn't even discussed trial specifics at this point if we had a unanimous verdict at this early stage it would have felt to me like we rushed to judgment if we didn't have a unanimous verdict then divisions amongst us would arise first thing I thought a vote at this early stage was a really bad idea Larry quickly came in and agreed with me as well as most of the other jurors so we went on to evaluate each witness in the sequence they appeared during the trial the first prosecution witness Martina Wilson was a young black female dressed inappropriately for a court appearance she wore a red paisley bandana had red dyed colored hair and wore loud red tinted sunglasses she was dressed in a tight red sequin top with tight white stretch pants she spoke in street slang her testimony really didn't offer much other than to put Bryant Childs and Stephen Smith in the general vicinity of the crime a few hours before it occurred she may have been the woman they were allegedly fighting over but this was just slightly inferred as a motive during the trial she really didn't offer much to the prosecution's case because the defense never denied that Bryant and Stephen were in that proximity when I first cited her as being the initial witness in the case Dick asked what was that all about I'm not even certain why she testified Larry said yeah she didn't do much for me either Jen then commented I think she was just used to place the victim and the defendant in the area of the crime scene sometime close to when the crime was committed she also may have been the girl they were fighting over I shared the same sentiment as Jen and I expressed that Ms. Wilson just testified that she and the defendant went out that Saturday night and returned to the area of the crime sometime prior to midnight she also claimed to have seen the victim in the same proximity when she left the area around midnight the crime occurred sometime between 2 a.m. and 4 30 a.m. that Sunday morning so Ms. Wilson was not there when the crime occurred all of us were ambivalent about her testimony it didn't do much to help or hurt either side her testimony along with that of other witnesses did provide us an idea of what a warm Saturday night is like in the Baines Street area of Chester Pennsylvania there are a couple of bars on the street plenty of foot traffic drug deals and frequent shootings in fact detective Slotnick testified that shell casings are so frequently discarded on the sidewalks in that area that it is not uncommon to be unable to match a shell casing with a bullet for a particular shooting the prosecution's second witness was David Jackson he came into the courtroom leaning on a crutch he was a 40 year old black male dressed in a jean jacket t-shirt and blue jeans he often grimaced in pain and stated that he had a blood clot in his leg apparently this pain came and went in varying degrees of intensity in the beginning of his testimony every other sentence was paused with a gasping sigh of pain as he continued his testimony the size of pain subsided he was uneducated and his speech was garbled and slurred he was a father of four children and a recovering cocaine addict I wouldn't be surprised if he had spent some time living on the street he admitted he was smoking crack and drinking beer the night of the murder he testified that he sold drugs for Stephen Smith a short time before the murder he stated that Smith gave him some drugs as a form of payment for his efforts it didn't appear that the victim had the social innocence of a choir boy according to the testimony thus far Smith was in a bad neighborhood at a bad time of night involved in drug sales I'm not saying that the victim needed killing but I am saying that it looked like he hung with a rough crowd 
at bad places and at bad times. Jackson claimed to be across the street when the shooting took place. When the gunshots went off, he said he hid behind a parked blue station wagon parked directly across the street. He stated that he saw Bryant Childs shoot Stephen Smith twice in the head at point-blank range. After the first shot, Jackson said Smith was on the ground begging for his life before the second fatal shot was fired. He also stated that Bryant saw him in the immediate moments following the murder. Upon cross-examination, the defense tried to raise the point that Smith had a prior employment rapport with Jackson. Jackson admitted to having washed Smith's car on occasion for $20, but that was it. I think the defense was trying to establish that Jackson may have had empathy for Smith and therefore a reason to implicate Bryant Childs in the murder. It wasn't a strong counter-argument, but I didn't blame the defense for trying it. It was the defense attorney's job to try to mitigate the damage of the prosecution witness, and Galvin later proved to be successful in doing so with this witness. The matter regarding washing cars was moot. It was like adding a handful of sand to the Jersey Shore beach. Jackson admitted to being intoxicated the night of the murder, and Galvin effectively harped on this point during cross-examination. He testified to drinking a 32-ounce bottle of malt liquor and smoking crack and marijuana in the time prior to the murder. The defense also effectively pointed out Jackson's extensive criminal record. When the defense presented their case, both sides stipulated that during his preliminary interview, David Jackson indicated another person had shot Stephen on that night. This stipulation was brought out immediately after one of the times the jury was removed from the courtroom. Not being in the courtroom, I have no way of knowing what was being argued, but I think it is a safe assumption to infer that issues regarding Jackson's preliminary interview statement were being argued at the time. Maybe Jackson wasn't available to be recalled as a witness, or maybe there was some type of legal technicality associated with the preliminary statement. Regardless, it did not make much of a difference to me or the rest of the jurors. In my mind, and in the other jurors' minds, Jackson had no credibility. Previously identifying someone else as the murderer was a huge inconsistency for me. The fact that he admitted to being drunk, high, and having prior criminal convictions did not do much to bolster his testimony either. Jackson was not offered any deal from the prosecutor's office for his testimony. If there was any shred of his testimony that bolstered the state's case, it was that he confirmed Bryant Childs saw him in the moments immediately following the murder. Later, Detective Slotnick would testify, reading from a statement made by Bryant Childs, that Childs told the detective the only witness they had was a junkie. That could have been a reference to Jackson, confirming the presence at the crime scene. I gave no weight to that point, because it also may not have been an inference to Jackson, or Childs might have gotten that information secondhand after the murder. It was a non-issue for me, and I think the rest of the jury. None of us could give much credibility to David Jackson's testimony. It was disjointed, had inconsistencies, and contradicted prior statements that he made. He was a drug addict and was drunk and under the influence of various narcotics on the night of the murder. He had several previous arrests for failing to make child support payments and other drug-related charges. Larry said, I couldn't give his testimony any credibility. Dick added, I put no stock in anything he said. Jen said, I was even having trouble understanding him. To this point, using a boxing analogy, the prosecution threw a left and a right, and the left glanced the target, putting Childs and Smith in the area at the time of the murder via the first witness, and the right was totally blocked. Then came the prosecution's third witness, Linda Manley. Linda Manley was the most compelling witness in the case. On the morning of the crime, just after 2 a.m., she left a friend's house on the same street 
Bain Street in the same block that the murder had taken place. Her car was parked on the street, and when she got into it, Bryant approached the car's passenger side and looked into it. They made eye contact, but no words were exchanged. Ms. Manley then proceeded to the local mobile gas mini-mart to buy cigarettes. She made one more brief stop at a friend's house and then returned around 4 a.m. When she turned on to Bain Street to return to where her car was previously parked, she saw Stephen Smith walking across 3rd Street, which ran perpendicular to Bain Street. Linda approached Bain Street from 3rd Street, and she waved at Stephen when she turned on to Bain's. She knew Stephen personally and knew of Bryant. As she parked her car in the same spot she had left it, just a few feet in front of her, she witnessed the crime. The murder took place on the sidewalk of Bain Street, at the entrance to an alleyway between two adjacent row houses. The alleyway might have been four feet wide. Stephen's body was found on the sidewalk in the 200 block of Bain Street. After witnessing the murder, Ms. Manley proceeded directly into her friend's house a few doors down from where the murder took place. Linda Manley had some baggage of her own. She was arrested a couple of years prior for writing bad checks, and she was also picked up for shoplifting. She was currently on probation for carrying a controlled substance. The defense brought out all these matters up in an attempt to discredit her testimony. She pleaded guilty to all these charges and seemed to be trying to turn her life around. Ms. Manley appeared to be in her mid-30s. She had young children and was a single mother. She was about 5 feet 8 inches tall and very heavy set. I'd say she weighed about 250 pounds. She wore large red oval glasses that often slid down her short, stout nose. She would occasionally remove her glasses and wipe away tears while testifying. Her testimony was clear, consistent, and unambiguous. She was offered no deal by the prosecutor to testify. She had moved out of Chester to another Philadelphia suburb shortly after the crime. She stated that she feared for her and her children's safety, and it didn't take much speculation to believe that that was an issue in her decision to move out of Chester. If Bryant Childs did kill Stephen Smith at point-blank range, it was likely for something less than life in prison, which was what Linda Manley's testimony might mean to Bryant Childs' future. Bryant Childs likely knew her phone number and address, so testifying posed some serious risks to her. She had everything to lose by testifying and nothing to gain. The murder occurred on October 7th, yet Ms. Manley did not give her statement to police until December 14th. An explanation for this delay was never given. Being frightened for the lives of herself and her children may have been the reason but that is purely speculation. There were many pieces of evidence that, as a jury, we were not privy to. I can only speculate, but I think the defense counsel did a good job of keeping as much incriminating testimony from us as possible. We never knew how the police were notified about the crime, who, if anyone, called 911, if Stephen Smith was dead on the scene or if he died at the hospital, and various other details that would seem to be helpful in reaching a verdict. The other piece of Ms. Manley's testimony that was incriminating to the defendant was the phone call she received from the home of Bryant Child's mother while he was being held in jail. Ms. Manley testified that she received a call originating from Mrs. Child's residence. Ms. Manley starred 69 the call and identified where it came from. The voice was Bryant's telling her that if she testified that she said she saw Bryant do it because the district attorney told her to say that, that he would pay her a sum of money after he got out of jail. This portion of her testimony was hotly contested by the defense. We had to leave the courtroom several times when this matter was being argued. Ms. Manley could not testify directly to what she alleged Bryant said to her over the phone, that would be hearsay. 
the prosecutor had to use a roundabout line of questioning to get this evidence before us. Also, the alleged manner in which Bryant called Linda Manley was that he first called his mother, and his mother had a three-way line. Mrs. Childs then held Bryant's call on the line and dialed Linda's number on the other line so all three could talk. When Linda discovered that Bryant was speaking to her, she immediately hung up the phone and called Detective Slotnick, who was assigned to the case. A Verizon phone employee testified that all these calls took place. The defense tried to limit its impact by bringing in the fact that any prisoner could have used Bryant's access code to make the call to Bryant's mother. The phone record could not definitively identify Bryant as the caller from the jail cell, although the call came from Bryant's specific cell block using his access code. A newspaper reporter covering the trial included this account in an article appearing in the regional paper. Yesterday, witness Linda Manley took the stand in Judge Robert C. Brown's courtroom and told of a phone call she received December 12th. About 12.30 p.m., Manley said she answered a call asking for a Linda Manley by a person who identified himself as Bryant. I need to talk to you, he allegedly said. You don't need to talk to me, Manley responded. This is my life, he said, according to her testimony. If you go into court and say what they told you to say, I'll pay you for what you say when I get out. She hung up the phone. I feared for my children's safety and for mine, Manley said. She also testified that she was never told what to say in court. What she said, she actually experienced. Everyone thought that Ms. Manley was very credible. I think I was the juror who had the most problem with her prior criminal record. There was a pattern of dishonesty there, some of it occurring while she was being charged with other offenses. She was also a mother, and that type of behavior is not what I would call an optimal parental consideration for family stability. If you are willing to risk the future livelihood of your adolescent children to pursue criminal activity while you're being investigated on other criminal charges, that doesn't say much for your integrity, in my mind at least. Still, she admitted guilt to all these offenses, and they were not serious, violent crimes. When Ms. Manley was cross-examined, her open, unambiguous testimony turned on a dime and became guarded and somewhat vague. She was a witness who was prepared for cross-examination, and she didn't want to give the defense anything that they could construe in a way that would undercut her testimony. The defense didn't spend much time with her. Defense attorney Galvin attempted to pull out some timeline inconsistencies, but she was so vague concerning time specifics that she really gave him nothing he could use. He reiterated her criminal past, and that was about it. After we discussed Ms. Manley for an hour or so, Larry said, I think maybe we should stop right here. The rest of the prosecution's witnesses were mostly either uncontested or forensic witnesses. Detective Slotnick brought in the fact that Bryant stated that only a junkie claimed to see the crime, an inferred reference to David Jackson but that was about the only other non-forensic witness testimony that implicated Bryant. The rest of the witnesses were the medical examiner, ballistics expert, corrections officer, Detective Slotnick, and the Verizon phone employee. Larry added that, maybe we should take a preliminary vote right now to see where we are. I didn't have an objection to that suggestion at this time, but I still wanted to deliberate further. I was going to vote not guilty just so we could take the case apart further. I didn't want a unanimous decision at this early stage and thought there may be one or two others in the room who felt the same way. I knew there were going to be some guilty votes, but I wasn't ready to convict at this early stage of deliberation. Still, I wasn't opposed to a vote at this stage just to see where we were as a group. We tore up slips of paper and passed around an empty brown bag that contained the bagels I brought in that morning. 
We all wrote our votes down on small torn slips of yellow lined paper, folded them and placed them into the bag. I read the votes out loud. One, guilty. Two, guilty. Three, guilty. Four, guilty. Five, guilty. Six, guilty. Seven, guilty. Eight, guilty. Nine, guilty. Ten, guilty. Eleven, guilty. Twelve, not guilty. By sheer luck, or bad luck, I selected my vote last out of the brown paper bag. Funny, but at this early stage, we didn't even talk about the specific counts before we voted. I think everyone subliminally concluded that if we found him guilty of murder, then we would also find him guilty on the other charges. Logically, I didn't feel that way at all. I felt it was our duty to go through all the counts and make sure we had a consensus that he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt to all the specific counts of each charge. The feeling of my thinking one way and 11 people thinking another would be a repeated one throughout the deliberations. Juror. 